We're getting towards the end of the year, and this mm -hmm. is always a time for reflection. And I find myself thinking back, all the way back, to episode number 50, Billy Jack. Oh, oh. As you might recall, there was a character in there named Bernard. He's a reprehensible human being. Yes, he's the one who gets karate chopped in the neck. That's right. To death. Yes. And in one scene, he's wearing a particular shirt, and I have this comment to say about it. Nice blouse, Bernard. As you at home have already guessed, I am currently wearing the exact same shirt. <laughs> exactly. It even has the same cuffs. You can see that right there. I have Bernard's shirt. So I hope that this shirt is the only way that I'm in any way like Bernard. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. The West is the best, as Jim Morrison once famously sang. Unfortunately for us, we are going east of Eden. Oh, really? Released in 1955, E.O.E. -E was directed by Elia Kazan and stars James Dean, Julie Harris, Burl Ives, and Basement alum Raymond Massey. It is based on the novel of the same name by John Steinbeck. Co-star Joe Van Fleet won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress for her role in this film. Dean was posthumously nominated for Best Actor, having died in a car accident just six months after the film was released. James Dean is dead? James Dean is dead. I thought he was just washed up. Eden. Adam. Eve, God, religion, science, Darwin, <laughs> gift. Ah, something called evolution cards. Those will help you evolve. Not to get rid of your prehensile tail, but maybe get rid of your prehensile faults. Yeah, it's not a game, unless you see life as a game, which you shouldn't. How will I create more abundance today? <laughs> So the, like, daily affirmation tasks kind yes. of thing. Yes. Accepting that there is an abundance of everything means there is plenty for you. Well, it's my understanding that this movie is about two brothers who don't exactly agree, so these cards probably could have helped them out. Yeah. So bypass the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and shimmy right by that angel with the flaming sword and join us on the old leather couch because we're going to enjoy the classic film East of Eden. So the movie's called Overture? No, it's called East of Eden. Uh, this makes no sense so far. I give it zero stars right off the bat. With no hope of <laughs> any stars? <laughs> Just, <laughs> you've made up your mind. <laughs> Another California sandwich. I read all of that. Monterey, 1917. The squirrely little fella is creeping around town and looking at this lady as she's doing her banking. He's got a real River Phoenix quality, this one. Nice fat deposit. You're sure in the right business, Sally. You're my favorite customer. <laughs> her name is Kate. His name is Cal. He wants to talk to her. He just can't get up the courage. So he gets back on the train and he goes back to Salinas where he lives with his father, Adam, and his brother, Aaron, who has a fiancé named Abra. Do they even make those anymore? Those book straps? Like where you just strap your books together? It's a belt. It's just a belt? It's just a belt. You used to work in a bookstore. It would come in handy. We never had belts. We just would shuffle around our pants around our ankles trying to sell books. It was ridiculous. Adam is in the ice business. He thinks that ice will be able to freeze vegetables and then you can ship them longer distances. Adam's always kind of angry at Cal. Well, what have you got to say for yourself? You see, Cal is the bad son. He is reminded about this all the time. When you were his age, Will, I imagine you thought it only right to let your father know before you stayed out all night. Well, when I'm your age, I hope I learn such effective passive aggression. Put out that cigarette! Get off the shed! <laughs> Abra? Cadabra. You're going to make a wonderful mother, Abra. You're going to give birth to a big litter of puppies. You're going to be a weird mother. Cal sees Aaron and Abra in the ice house and they're canoodling in there. He doesn't like that. He wrecks a bunch of the ice. And you are forgiven, Cal. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. His dad is very unhappy, makes him read the Bible. Cal doesn't really take this exercise seriously and that only gets Adam more angry. You have no repentance. You're bad. You're bad. You're bad. Chamon. Their whole 
childhood, Adam the father, Adam Trask, has told them that their mother died. But Cal knows that mom didn't die. She's that woman down in Monterey. What was she like? Was she bad? She wasn't like other people. In fact, she was a horse. <laughs> very, very strange woman. And that house she's in is a house of ill repute. A body house. A brothel, if you will. It's a crowded house at night. What do you want? I want uh, what do you want to drink? Bowser's and tonic. Mm, PBR, gross. Tries to find out where Kate is. She is the lady of the house. You let me talk to you? Please. Joe! Joe! And Joe bounces him out of that house. And Cal ends up down at the police station. How'd you find out about Kate, anyway? Kid, do you think I look like a snowman? Do you think someday I'll be rendered in snowman form? I know this is a strange question, but these are the things that trouble me late at night. I think for James Dean, it's impossible for him to be in a scene where he's not touching an object or leaning against a wall mm -hmm. or touching his own face. Yeah. Face. <laughs> leaning. <laughs> Crouching. That's another thing. He can, he can crouch. Back in the day, Kate shot Cal's father, and that's why Dad considers her dead to him. He must have done something to hurt her. Grabbing and leaning. At the lettuce farm. Morning, Mr. Trask. Mr. Trash. <laughs> it's Trask, actually. He needs to try to impress his father in a different way. And he makes a lettuce shoot for the lettuce to roll down so people can deal with the lettuce easier. Dad loves the idea. I think you better have your lunch now. It's time. It's going to be all lettuce, unfortunately, but, you know, that's you, you knew that. Adam's going to take the lettuce train. He's going to line it with ice. He's going to keep that lettuce chilled so it stays fresher longer. <laughs> They really need World War One to start because their band is just sending off lettuce. That's what they're there for. It's time to start counting chickens. They go on down to the car dealership. Let me show you how, how the car works. It goes up, 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 dip, dip, ba. See this little wire sticking out of the radiator? Well, that's a choke. Now watch careful. <laughs> that puts her on battery. See where it says bat? Oh, yes, yes, bat. Bats? The train was stopped by snow in the mountains, and all of the ice melted in the snow in the mountains, which is just kind of hitting me now. That's, that's kind of a perfect condition for a early ice truck to be in, a snowy condition. Dad is out a lot of money. Cal wants to help his father. He's talking to this guy who says that beans are going to go up really high in price once the war starts. Unlike lettuce, beans keep. You just dry them up, send them overseas. It's going to be fine. You can can beans. You can throw them at the Germans to make them angry. It's a good market for beans these days. Cal wants to become a beans grower. So i got to get enough money to give my father back what he lost. He goes over there to Monterey. He talks to his mother, Kate. I want $5,000 so I can get into beans. I'll pay you back. I'll give you interest. I'll give you interest uh, like this. Told me that, uh, I'll be real interested. Be right. Mom writes him a check. America goes to war. <laughs> Never have a Willie or a Sam. <laughs> old man, man I'm Mannery. And I read the eighth I am. Everyone has war fever except for Aaron. I'm a pacifist. I don't believe in this war. And their full membership drive. <laughs> German Public Radio. Farmers. What's a farmer got to do with war? War. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. And I'll say it again. Just as predicted, the price of beans is going through the roof. Cal is making a tidy profit. James Bean. Where have you been? Where have you been? At the carnival. I only wish that there was some massive armed conflict that he could use this ability in. Cal and Abra 
have fun. They throw baseballs at jugs like people used to in the old days. They go on a Ferris wheel. They seem to be falling in love, and in fact... <laughs> They kiss. Yeah, kissing on the Ferris wheel. That's what lovers do. And immediately Abra feels horrible about this. She crouches over like she's some sort of James Dean. <laughs> oh, he's leaning and crouching and face touching. Cal and Aaron get into a fight. Because Aaron knows that Cal is sweet on Abra. Cal gets drunk. Crouching, leaning, touch the face. Do it to touch the face. I just need dad to love me tomorrow he talks to his bean partner give me my five thousand dollars i want to give it to my dad as a present and i want to throw him a big birthday party i gotta tell you something can you keep a secret i'm a german spy <laughs> he tells abra of the party plans you could come and help me get some junk heroin you want it's that kind of party okay i can get freaky the party's all set up Dad comes by. Cal gives him the gift. But then Aaron shows up and says, I have a gift for you too, Dad. We're engaged. Dad thinks that that's a really great gift. But you haven't opened Cal's present yet. No. And I won't. Because I wanted a bicycle and it's clearly not that. <laughs> he opens it up. It's that money. Next time you want to buy me a gift, make it a pile of cash. $5,000. He finds out that Cal basically is being a war profiteer. By exploiting the price of beans and exploiting the local farmers in some way. I, I don't know. I don't know bean politics. I don't know the the bean situation in Salinas in World War I. I should. But I don't. I guess I slept through that day of school. This is not money that I can accept. Don't you know that people are dying over there? How could you disappoint me so, my son? Crouching, leaning, face touching, the boys got it all. Oh, Cal is upset. Oh man, he's so James Deaning right now, he's gonna go China Syndrome. Just like <laughs> sink through the floor. He goes out to the tree, and Aaron sees what's going on. He knows that these two are fooling around. And Cal, ooh, he wants to do something terrible to his brother. Come with me. I got something to show you. Come to this whorehouse in Monterey. Look at the person who runs it. Here's that mom you thought was dead. Oh, Cal, you're blander, brother. Your world is crumbling, Aaron. This basically drives Aaron insane. Where's Aaron? I don't know. It's not my brother's keeper. Where did you go? Where oh, that's a weird oh. shot. That's a really weird <laughs> shot. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that. Aaron gets drunk. He's leaving on that troop train tonight and says he's going to enlist tomorrow at King City. And go off to war. They try to stop him. He puts his head through a window. Dad has a stroke. He's not dead. He's intensely bedridden, paralytic. Abra's in there talking to him and says, Hey, your son didn't mean to disappoint you. He really loves you, and I know you love him, and I'm going to get him to come in and talk to you. She goes and tries to get Cal to come in and talk to him. Cal comes in and talks to him. Cal. Gotcha. Cal, you're my favorite son in town right now. Of all my sons who's in town, you are tops. They love each other after all. It's a good thing I did that thing to make my brother go away so I could have his girlfriend. And it's also a good thing that I did that thing with the beans and made all that money. And it's a good thing that I did the thing that made my brother go away because now I've connected with you because I gave you a stroke. This plan came off perfectly. And I met Mom. And it all happened west of East of Eden. Well, the overture's finally over. Now we can get to the movie. Yes. Kazan finally makes it to the basement. Yeah, and this is probably a movie that both of us have been aware of for most of our adult lives and has just never watched it. I've been trying to figure this out for the last two hours. I didn't see Rebel Without a Cause until I was in my late 30s. I have not seen Giant. This is my first time seeing this movie. Why have I been avoiding James Dean? One of the big three male actors, you know, him, Monty Clifton, and Brando. Tell me what James Dean has that no one else has. Because he seems to have a quality that those other two guys, Brando and Monty Cliff, do not have. Montgomery Cliff, when you watch him, you can just feel the emotion radiating out of him. 
he doesn't have to do much of anything, but he just has these eyes that you can just feel the world. Marlon Brando has this cat-like way of moving, or he just has a control over his body. He seems impulsive, he seems spontaneous. Now, James Dean is unlike anyone else. He's the only person who's really pulled this off. He's just so spontaneous in all of his actions, to the point of almost absurdity, but he knows where to stop. He's reacting in the moment to everything. He's so improvisational. The other two are more mannered than he is. When I think of Montgomery Clift, it seems like he's a master of projecting his emotions, mm -hmm. whereas James Dean is possessed by his emotions. Yeah. Brando and Clift are masters of control, and James Dean has no control. This kid's like a flickering flame. Endless fireworks show that he has. He's an amazing listener. You can just see him hearing every word, and his character is so desperate that every word someone says to him is either a weapon or a, a tool or or a blessing. I found the story to be very slight. I didn't connect with it. And it seems like this movie's not about story. It's not about plot. It's about scenes. Mm -hmm. It's about this scene happening where these two people do this thing and then the next scene. It's more that it's a series of scenes and a series of connections mm -hmm. than a story that's going to engage you or draw you in. It's a movie about relationships. Relationships, uh, About yeah. these mm -hmm. relationships between these four people. Five, I guess there's also Kate. Of the characters in the movie, Aaron is woefully underserved. He is not given nearly the amount of character that that character needs. It feels like he's barely in the movie. So this is a retelling of the Cain and Abel story. I've always expected this to end with Caleb killing Aaron. I was surprised that it came to this conclusion where instead of being overtly killed, he just kind of sends him off to die on the other side of the world. And instead of Cain being cursed, he's sort of redeemed in the end. He is redeemed. Because that's how we do things in America. East of Eden has closed its gates, and now it's time for us to head back out west to Seen It. Seen It. Grey Vyth. Matrix Resurrections. That ship sailed 20 years ago. Did not need the reboot. Seen It. Not seen it. I saw the trailer for this in the theater, and I thought, oh man, is this the Matrix movie that I'm going to end up loving? Because the trailer looked really good. Mm hmm Was not the case. It's probably the worst of the four. They took all of the actors who were too old and mm -hmm. just replaced them with these bland, younger actors. And the plot seemed dependent on whether or not you watched all three movies yesterday. Oh, okay. Also, it was well known that Lana Wachowski did not want to be involved with it, but they were going to make it with or without her, and that shows on the screen. Uh -huh. The lack of enthusiasm. The best thing about every Matrix movie is that they're based in these brilliant visionary ideas. And the worst thing about every Matrix movie is that they're bogged down with bad writing and this desperate desire to make every single frame of the movie cool. Tim Lemire writes, The Narrow Margin. Seen it. I seen it, and I also saw the 80s remake with Gene Hackman and Ann Archer, I believe. Possibly. Very good remake. Oh, I like both versions of the movie. All right, for those of you who don't know the original, it's about a police officer who has to protect a witness on a train from Chicago to Los Angeles. Almost the entire thing happens on the train, and there's bad guys trying to get them. Really nice train-based thriller. Yeah, 78 minutes long, which I love. It's tight right from the start, and you don't have enough time to get bored. The main actress in, in here, her name is Marie Windsor, and mm -hmm. she should have been a much bigger star. She's an Ida Lupino type, but she's funnier and sexier. She looks like Ida Lupino, and Joan Crawford had a daughter. Sabrina Ventrella, have you seen Last Night in Soho? Seen it. Seen it! What did you think? That's what I thought. I love Edgar Wright, but... He doesn't seem to know what he wants to be anymore. He starts out as kind of a parody pastiche filmmaker, and he does the best parody pastiches, like three great ones. He doesn't seem to want to be funny anymore. Right. I'm not asking him to keep doing Shaun of the Dead. To make a comedy. I didn't understand how a movie with a story as interesting as this, and a movie that is so visually engaging could be so tedious. Mm -hmm. I was just so bored with it by the middle of it. It does have this amazing dance sequence where, and it was mostly done in camera, where you have one actor dancing with two women who are both the same woman. Yeah. And it's very little CGI is used in that. And still I'm like, oh, they're doing stuff. Yeah. Why is it? 
and it's peopled with actors who are fascinating. He tried to make Suspiria, he tried to make Roman Polanski's Repulsion, and he didn't even make an Edgar Wright movie. Huh. Michael Rafino, seen it. Hell's a poppin'. Stinky Miller, go home. Seen it. <laughs> the first 15 minutes of this movie... I thought I could die right there. And go straight to hell and you'd enjoy every minute. I'd be like, yes. The movie starts with chorus girls exploding and <laughs> then they're in hell. The amount of jokes per square inch of that opening montage of the movie, it's, it's uncountable. It's staggering. Tex Avery, when he was making cartoons, he couldn't have kept up with this movie. I can't prepare you for what you are going to see. You can find it on YouTube these days. Go watch it. I watched it, and then two nights later, I watched it again. I do have to say that once the movie proper started, I was like, oh, this is a fine, like, Marx Brothers level comedy. But I was really hoping it would be those opening 15 minutes for an hour and a half. But I thought the two lovers were more interesting than the two lovers typically are in Marx Brothers movies. Mm -hmm. And then it also had Martha Ray, who is just this amazing clown of a woman. You can tell she's really sexy, but just knows how to play ugly. Sure. It seemed like this movie had kind of a progressive streak. Oh, yeah. There were certain things where he's like, get rid of those phony Hollywood Indians. Mm -hmm. People didn't say that in the 40s. <laughs> and the number with the the, the black performers, the, mm -hmm. this amazing Lindy Hop number, and then there's a, there's a musical performance before that. It's presented in such a way where it's not even close to being a minstrel show. Yeah. It's really a showcase of black excellence. Mm -hmm. And we see the white characters are just sort of eavesdropping. Like, they're not allowed in. Mm -hmm. It really glorifies these, these people and their talent. I think this movie is like 25 years ahead of its time. You can see the thread of absurdity that runs through this to... Your show of shows over to England with the the goon, the show, goon show. Yeah, that's and then what I was thinking. Through Monty yeah. Python, Mel Brooks, Airplane. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's there's a clear connection between this and all that stuff. Yeah, and it's uh, mostly forgotten. There's a place you can go that's not east or west of anything. It's right there on the internet. It's our website, welcome to the basement show .com. You can go there and see all of our episodes, the entire back catalog, and there are PayPal donation buttons that you can click on and make a one time or rolling monthly donation to support this show. You can. One of our generous donors is Vincent from the Netherlands. I wish I knew how to say thank you in your language, but I will say it in mine. Thank you. Gracias. If you want more Craig and Matt chat, you can watch Unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. We'll be opening mail and reading comments, and there will be all kinds of surprises. And now, take a look at this. With your eyes. Take you for a nice Please. ride in the Ferris wheel. You don't stop bothering me. I'll have to call somebody. Bye. Well, hello, Carol. This doughboy is manhandling me, putting his paws all over me, his doughy paws. I said, no boy, you doughboy. You have no repentance. You're bad.